Hello friends, it's Ben again. This is a video for the differential calculus class. Uh, we are taking a look at, uh, first of all, the section about the <clears throat> derivative of a function as a function itself, and then continuing on to take a look at a little bit of using the product rule for differentiation, okay? So uh, with regard to the, this sort of thing, um, what we need to do first of all is establish the notion. I had you all do one exercise like this uh, in the previous assignment, but more of an establishment of finding the derivative of a function uh, while keeping the um, the x value as an undetermined value. So let's take a look at an example of doing that real quick. And this will lead us to doing more and more examples of it because that's kind of a big deal to what we do. So here we go. So the function we're gonna take a look at here is gonna be x cubed minus 6x squared, right? Now, the thing with this definition of a derivative is that you can have an x in there and you need to realize that when you let delta x go to zero, that doesn't say anything about what happens to x. So it feels a little bit like you're dealing with more than one uh, variable at a time, but, um, uh, and hang on. Sorry, I have uh, animals in the background and I had to uh, step aside to deal with them. Okay. All right, so, so what we're going to do here is to just deal with the X as a symbol and just remember that X and Delta X are different symbols. So if I'm finding F prime of X, I'm doing the limit as delta x goes to zero. And now I need to take my expression for f of x and put x plus delta x inside there and cube it and minus six times x plus delta x and square it minus, now I need to just put in the x cubed and minus six x squared and then we're gonna divide all that by delta x. So limit delta x is gonna to go to zero. And I'm gonna go ahead and just do the algebra here in my head. I realize that when y'all are doing it, you probably have to stop and, and do the actual steps of it, but um, there's no need for y'all to have to watch me slowly and painfully do each and every step like that. However, please realize it is kind of long and messy here. Um, I'm going to put an extra bit here that's not necessarily necessary for what I'm doing, just to try to illustrate all of what y'all might have to do with this. All right, if you'll notice, um, you have a limit, delta x is going to zero here, and I've gone ahead and not distributed that six out initially, just to point out how you have to actually do that. And also notice that delta x is a variable that has two letters in the name of it. And that may seem a little bit confusing to y'all just because of the fact that you've been uh, used to always having variables that have one letter in the name. But um, because the delta helps us to remember that it's change of x that, that comes up. 
All right, I'm going to cancel out the things that are clear that they should cancel out. Okay, and now I'm going to go ahead and take this and copy it. And I'm going to put it onto a second page. Okay, so and I'll put it right here. And then we're doing this limit delta x is still going to zero. And I want us to observe that everything that remains has a delta x as a factor. If you are doing one of these problems and that is not the case in this step, then you have made an arithmetic error. The arithmetic error that is most popular to make is to fail to distribute the minus right here or, um, or ultimately to fail to distribute the minus six here or something like that, okay? So if the problem's not working out, you need to make sure that you realize it should have a factor of delta x and whatever remains, you have to backtrack and find your error, not just say, I don't know, and move on, okay? So that delta x being a factor of everything, then what remains has a 3x squared and a minus 3x delta x and a delta x squared and a minus 12x and then the delta x came out of that and then minus 6 delta x because one of those came out and the other did not. So we're dividing all that by a delta x and we cancel what should cancel. And now, if you'll notice, we no longer have a division by zero problem. And so when we take the limit as delta x goes to zero of this 3x squared minus 3x delta x plus delta x squared minus 12x minus 6 delta x, all the stuff that has a factor of delta x goes to zero and all the stuff that doesn't remains minus 12x. So that is our expression for f prime of x done using the definition. Okay. All right. So let's see. I've forgotten what the next one is here. Okay. Here's another where we're doing the same sort of thing. So we're going to get our g prime of x and it's gonna be a limit, so delta x goes to zero. And now everywhere there's an x, replace it with x plus delta x. So uh, x plus delta x minus the square root x plus delta x. And I need you to observe that the x plus delta x went in both places and that in the second place, it stayed under the square root. It's a very popular mistake to make for people to uh, just put a delta x out at the end of their function and say, to heck with it, that's what it will turn out to be. But if you do that, your derivative for every function that exists, for every x value will always turn out to be one. And it should be obvious that that's not the case because otherwise we wouldn't teach calculus because you wouldn't have to do anything. You could just say, well, the answer is one. So ca caution about that sort of thing. All right, so we have x plus delta x minus the square root, and we cannot distribute the square root. If we could, math would be much easier, but naturally nothing's nice like that, right? All right, so we get a plus x and a minus x. So those pieces are going to cancel out. And so now uh, we can take it to be a limit. Delta x is going to zero. And um, I'm going to separate it into two pieces. One piece will be delta x over delta x. You know, that's one and you just be done. And then the other piece, um, I started to put a minus, a plus, but I guess it should be a minus. 
the square root of x plus delta x. And since I factored out a minus to the front, then this plus will turn into a minus there. All right. So you should recognize that as one of our conjugate problems. So we're going to multiply it on the top and bottom. Ooh, my, my drawing tried to do something weird. We're going to multiply that on the top and the bottom by this x plus delta x under the square root and plus the square root of x. And as you recall, that is really setting up a difference of squares kind of thing. And that means that on top, we'll end up with an x plus delta x minus x. And all that divided by delta x times the square root of x plus delta x minus the square root of x. Oh, I said minus. I meant plus. Sorry. As, as your spot, I just tried to make an, a copying error right there. I tried to copy it as minus when it needed to be plus. But so we have a limit as delta x is going to zero. And oh, and we will have had this cancellation happen there. And that means that the delta x on the top and bottom are going to end up canceling. And that means now we have one minus one over square root of x plus delta x plus the square root of x. Now as delta x goes to zero, that x plus delta x will just be x. So that means we end up with one minus one over two square roots of x because they're both square roots of x, okay? So this whole thing of using the definition to differentiate, we can indeed get those to work out, okay? But we can also do things with the power rule. Um, hopefully you remember that when we take x to the n power and differentiate it, we lower the power by one and multiply by the old power, okay? So anytime you're differentiating polynomials, you will be able to just lower powers. And if you differentiate uh, polynomials enough times, you always end up getting zero after you differentiate, you know, you know enough times. So uh, we are going to real quick here, differentiate this one, h prime of x. And we are gonna, going to take x to the 5 fourths and just say 5 fourths of x to the 1 fourth, because we just subtracted 1 from the 5 fourths, minus 4 times. 4 is a constant. And as you recall, a constant times a function, when you differentiate it, you get a constant times the derivative of the function. So we can just put that minus 4 out front and then have minus 3 halves x to the, and now when it's a negative number and you subtract, it gets farther from zero. So now it's negative five halves power and plus 11 times x to the first. So the derivative of that will be one x to the zero, or you could just write it as one, okay? So in that case, we will have 5 fourths x to the 1 fourth power plus, um, oops, plus 6x to the negative 5 halves power plus 11. Okay. So um, now I have to try to remember that far enough to jump over to my Desmos app here. And hopefully I can find that. Gosh, that's messy. I should really tidy up a little bit. Mm. Okay, so thrillingly enough, I did not remember it. It was five fourths. Okay, the initial one was x to the five fourths 
minus four x to the minus three halves x power five fourths minus sorry four x to the minus three halves four x to the minus three halves and then it was i think plus 11x yeah plus 11x plus 11x okay so that's our first function there notice that it is not defined at all for negative values of x the reason for that is that you get that negative that uh, five fourths power and that three halves power and both of those are going to be even roots and when you take that for negative numbers you get uh, you get complex numbers all right so then we have to do another one of these and it is five fourths no man five fourths x to the one fourth and plus six x to the negative five halves power and plus that was supposed to be 11x up there and I put 1x so fixing it there all right so five fourths x to the negative plus six just checking to make sure that I got everything right there okay so um that is showing something on it that says that I wrote this down wrong and I cannot spot why okay all right I have copied something down incorrectly onto this and I don't know what it is the detail that you need to be spotting on this that I have apparently just put the wrong function on here somehow um, this function here looks like it has a uh, I, I don't know a, <clears throat> a minimum so that it's kind of turning from going down a little bit to going up a little bit so it looks like it, that minimum is about there if i had copied the correct function here i don't know what i did wrong with it um, then i should be finding that this place where the intercept happens for it should have been over here i have messed it up and i don't know how to fix it and i don't really feel super motivated for that and i apologize i'm going to pause the recording and see if i can see how see what i did wrong i'll be right back hi folks embarrassing little mistake there um, if you saw the graph that i was looking at i reversed which one was the original function which one was the derivative and so the uh simple the simple mistake was not paying attention to colors. It wasn't actually a problem with the math. So if you take a look there, the original function that I had was the red one. And if you take a look at it, it is always increasing. It's always going up. And, um, and so when you look at the derivative of that function, the graph of it shows it's always something positive. Now it is kind of descending down uh, and limiting onto, um, onto a line of uh, y equals 11. Come on, dude. Just give it to me as a dash line. Okay. And I said 11, but it decided not to register the second one. Okay. So you see how that asymptote, it's going down towards there. 
that uh, is an asymptote for the derivative, okay? And that means that if we look at the original function here, it would have a slant asymptote of y equals 11 x uh, plus something. And I don't know what the plus something would be. So I will put a C in there. Great, there, and add a slider. And so if we, if we could get it set up just right, we would see that it's trying to merge in towards that at probably C equals 10 or something. So anyway, uh, that is the thing that we're trying to look at with the two of them being on the same axes. The derivative will have zeros at the place where the function, <coughs> where the original function has maximums or minimums at, okay? So, all right, then let's take a look at another thing here. This is asking us to find the tangent line for y equals 3x squared minus 5x at a particular point. So tangent lines, of course, you need to know the slope and you need to know a point on the line and then you can set it up. We have a point on the line. You might check this and make sure if you plug in x equals 3, 3 times uh, 9 is 27 minus 5 times 3. Yeah, it turns out to be 12. So 312 is a point on the line. We just need to find the derivative. So uh, we're going to find that we did not get instructions that we have to use the definition. So we are just going to find the derivative, which we sometimes note as dy dx. And we're going to go ahead and use the power rule. So three times the derivative of x squared is 2x to the first minus five times the derivative of x is just one. So we end up with a 6x minus 5. Then dy dx evaluated at x equals 3 is going to be 6 times 3 minus 5. So 18 minus 5 is 13. And now you can write y minus 12 times, or y minus 12 equals the m, the slope of 13, times x minus the 3 from the point. If you want to leave it like that, it's fine. But I know lots of times people kind of like to get their y solved for and say y equals 13x. Let's see, minus 39 plus 12. So I think that's minus 27. OK, so finding a slope of a tangent line once you've got the, um, the power rule here and being able to factor out constants and add and subtract and stuff, uh, it's fairly straightforward. You just calculate a derivative, plug in, and then use your point slope formula. Okay. All right. So here's another one where it asks us to determine, uh, determine where something is increasing and decreasing. Increasing will be where the slope is positive. Decreasing will be where the slope is negative. So if you go ahead and find s prime of t here, then you'll get 6t squared. See how I just multiplied by 3 and lowered the power by 1? Minus 6 times t to the first and plus 0. Okay. Now, I need to know where this is increasing and decreasing, so I have to figure out where it's positive and negative. The only place it can switch from positive to negative is where it's either zero or undefined. Polynomials are always defined. So we really need to take that function, and I'm going to factor a t out of it. I have 6t times t minus 1, and I'm going to set it equal to zero. Now, if you've got uh, something that's factored and set equal to zero, then you can set each factor equal to zero. If you have it set equal to something that's not zero, then you can't do this. 
I might have had to deal with that a lot with teaching pre-calc classes, but you ought to be able to spot t equals zero and t equals one are the two places where this would be zero at. And then you can say, you can say to yourself, well, I'm just going to kind of lay out my line here and have um, I started to write it below, but I'll write it above. Um, have the t equals zero and the t equals one here. And then I'm going to check and figure out what is uh, some values that are between or to the side or something. And so in between here, I'll have to do t equals one half. But out to the right, I could do t equals two. Out to the left, I could do t equals negative one, right? If you have to pick test values, always try to pick zero and one. Couldn't pick those this time because those were my critical values where it was going to change sign at. So now I just need to figure out s prime at negative one s prime at one half and s prime at two okay the sign can only change at zero and one so the sign has to be the same everywhere to the left of zero so since s prime of negative one is going to turn out to be what six times negative one squared minus six times negative one is equal to six plus six is 12 and that's greater than zero then that means that for um, t less than zero that we're going to have this be in an increasing function it's going to be positive there um, because the notation is often interval notation, t less than zero goes minus infinity up to zero and then round parentheses. Okay. And we're going to figure out decreasing next. As you might guess, your intuition will be right here. At s prime, or figuring out s prime of one half, you are going to get a negative number but we should do the actual work of doing it. And so we would say six times one fourth is gonna be three halves and then minus three and you end up with a minus three halves and that is less than zero. So between zero and one, this is decreasing. It's, there's no way for it to change sign again until it gets to one. Okay, now after one, it might change or it might not. Sometimes things will, uh, will increase for a while and then flatten out and then increase again. So we still have to check it, but uh, you could probably guess what's gonna happen here. Let's see, uh, six times four is 24 minus, uh, so it's 12 again. And so that is gonna be increasing. And so I'll write union one to infinity, okay? So uh, the answer to this question about where is it increasing and where is it decreasing is going to actually be that it's increasing from minus infinity to zero and then again from one to infinity if you drew a graph of this you'd see it's going up in those intervals and then the only place it's going down is between zero and one you do not include the endpoints on that because those are the places where it changes all right so now we're going to go ahead and do some stuff with the product rule and uh, hopefully you've taken a look in your textbook and seen what's going on with that. I'll write down the shorthand of it right here because we're gonna use it. If you've got uh, two functions, f and g, they're multiplied together. You take the derivative, 
you take the derivative of the first, leave the second alone, and then plus you leave the first alone, take the derivative of the second. If you are taking a look at the function you've got here and saying, why don't we just multiply that out? We could just make a polynomial. Yes, you could totally do that. There are problems that are not polynomials and we're just doing an easy example to start with, okay? All right, so product rule to differentiate this, f prime of x, and we just have to think about that these two things, that you've got a product, and so you take the derivative of the first one, I'm just gonna write it, and leave the second one alone, plus now you leave the first one alone and take the derivative of the second one. So derivative of 2x plus 1, the derivative of 2x is going to be 2, the derivative of the 1 is going to be 0, and we leave the x cubed minus 3x alone. Plus, now we leave the 2x plus 1 alone, the derivative of x cubed is going to be 3, x squared, and then minus three times the derivative of x is just one. Oh, I don't know why that flipped on me there. And now we ought to simplify it, okay? So we've got two times x cubed minus three x plus two x plus one times this three x squared minus three, okay? If you're actually going to do something with it, you'll probably need to go ahead and multiply out. So we'll have 2x cubed minus 6x plus 6x cubed um, minus 6x plus 3x squared minus 3. And we're just putting it all together and we'll have 8x cubed plus three x squared minus 12 x minus three. Boom, we've got it. Now, if we were doing something with that, we might need to set that equal to zero like we had to do on the previous problem and try to solve by factoring, okay? This being a cubic, you, you don't have the quadratic formula there to use if you're solving for it. So what you would, what you might have to do is to take a look at a graph of it, see where it hits the zero. Maybe it hits it at x equals three. I don't know. But if it does hit at x equals three, then you could factor an x, an x minus three out by doing long division, okay? Try not to get all of your answers by just looking at graphs. So, all right, this one here, we're going to use the product rule again, and we're going to differentiate x squared e to the x, and then we're going to talk about where it's increasing and decreasing. So your derivative here, you have to recognize that we have a product. And so the derivative of x squared, and leave the e to the x alone, plus the x squared times the derivative of e to the x. So that's equal to 2x e to the x plus x squared. And now you have to remember that we found out the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x, okay? So if we're gonna find out where that's increasing and decreasing, we're gonna have to set this equal to zero. It would be a smart idea for us to factor it. You can see that e to the x is a factor of the whole thing, but, um, that leaves us with 2x plus x squared. And then that's something that you can take an x out of. And um, I probably should leave a little bit more space there or something. x and then a 2 plus x, okay? So when you set that equal to zero, e to the x can never be zero, but the other two could be zero when x is zero or x equals minus two. Oops. Equals 
minus two. Okay. So think about laying those out on the number line again, and you've got minus two and you get zero. And so you'll, as a sample, use minus three, minus one, and one. So g prime of minus three is gonna be equal to e to the minus three times, let's see, two times minus three is minus six plus minus three squared is nine. So that will end up being three e to the minus three, which is positive. G prime of negative one is e to the negative one um, times, uh, uh, times negative two plus one, which is going to then be negative e to the minus one, which is negative. And g prime of positive one is e to the one times three, which is positive. So if I'm talking about increasing and decreasing, I need to pick out where did my sample points give me positives and negatives? Well, the only place that I ended up getting negatives was here for the g prime of negative one. The only place that you can change signs is at negative two and zero. So that means that between negative two and zero, the function had to be decreasing. And then and the other two places where it was increasing was to the left of minus two, so minus infinity up to minus two, and to the right of zero, so zero to infinity. And you put a u between them to indicate that uh, you are meaning to include both pieces in your answer. Okay, so that is that. Uh, I, I have to confess you all, the, these videos still feel weird to me. I always want to ask any questions, but you know, you're not there. Uh, all right, so this is a bit of an applications problem. So you've got the sales of a product given by S of X equals 20 minus 0.6 X. If you've had an economics class, you know that the demand for a product is going to be inversely proportional to uh, inversely related to the price of the product. And so that's the reason why we have the number of sales being a decreasing function. Now, it's important for you to realize that even though I'm writing it as a linear decrease, it's probably not. It's probably some weird, weird function that you don't even have a formula for. But what we do is we get a bunch of data and we get a linear approximation in order to make a guess about it. So when we talk about this problem here about maximizing revenue, we always do it with a linear function, but really the S probably isn't a linear function, okay? So it says uh, um, the revenue is gonna be X, X being the, um, the price, yeah, and times S of X, the number of sales. And we need to figure out what price maximizes the revenue. So for that maximization, we are going to be looking for where the R prime of X is zero, because what will happen is that the graph of your function R of X will be something like this. It will have a positive slope as it increases and then a negative slope as it decreases. And so we are going to be looking for where it's actually equal, uh, has a derivative equal to zero. So product rule again, we're gonna come along and say the derivative of X, which is one times S of X plus X times S prime of X, okay? And I need you all to spot that if you had a different function for S, you could just substitute it in here. 
So I'm going to write s of x plus x times s prime of x. Y'all can see that that s prime of x. Um, yeah, no, I'm going to just write s prime of x here. Uh, the s of x was 20 minus 0.6x plus x times. That s prime of x was uh, negative 0.6, right? Because the, con the constant part would just give you 0. And then this is equal to 20 minus 1.2x. So we're going to set that equal to zero and solve. And so you end up with your x equals negative 20 and then divide it by the negative 1.2. And I ought to be able to do that in my head. The negatives cancel the 20 times. We're dividing by 6 fifths, so we really have 5 6. So we have 100 over 6. And that would be 50 over 3. Um, And uh, since we're talking about prices, we probably want to go ahead and approximate that and see 48, 16, $16.67 for whatever this product is. <clears throat> so uh, this sort of thing is not probably something that is literally done when you're doing uh, market research, but you do want to figure out where to put the price of a product so that you get the optimal, uh, the maximum amount of revenue coming out of sales. If you price it too low, eh, um, you may get a lot of sales, but you're not getting much profit per sale, and therefore you're not going to maximize the price. But if you jack the price up too much, people will say, Psh, I don't need this, I'll go buy it, uh, go buy a cheaper product that's a substitute good, and you will get less sales, which would mean that you get less profit there as well. So there's a trade-off thing where you gotta meet somewhere, you gotta meet something right in the middle. So that is a math application. I'm not gonna dwell on it a whole bunch, but it's something that's not super hard to see, and it does come up in your economics stuff. So all right. I'll let y'all go and uh, see you in class.